Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us today for our webinar, Managing Your Growing Law Firm for Success. My name is Mike Swanson. I'm your host today. And uh, we'll be spending a few minutes today talking about some business issues about um, contingent fee law firms. So um, this is me. I'm the president and CEO of Advocate Capital. I'm also the author of a book called How David Beats Goliath, Access to Capital for Contingent Fee Law Firms. It's the only published book designed to help plaintiff lawyers in terms of financial matters. Uh, it's available on iTunes, Barnes and Noble, and um, Amazon, of course, as a as a Kindle book. Uh, great. So before we get started, disclaimer: I want to be careful here. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not an accountant. Before you consider taking any actions or not taking any actions, um, I encourage you to consult with your professional. Do feel free to share some of this content with your legal and accounting professionals um, if you'd like to. It's designed for information only. All right, another disclaimer, I talk fast. I also drink coffee, which helps me talk fast. Um, so if you miss something here, don't worry. You'll get a link to the recording of this webinar on YouTube, and uh, you can email me if you would like, and I can send you a copy of the slide deck, mswanson at advocatecapital.com. So how am I qualified to talk about managing a growing law firm for success? A couple things in my um, career I've done uh, in the past 30 years. First was a business that my business partner Dan Tossig and I started in 1989 with an empty desk and a telephone. We started this company, Champion America. It still exists today. Uh, after 10 years, we uh, went from zero customers to 293,000 customers in all 50 U.S. states. We were mailing 9 million catalogs a year. We sold that business to a public company in 1999 and we moved on to our next project uh, whereby we bought a little company here in Nashville called Advocate Capital. And Advocate Capital is now the premier provider of case expense funding service for plaintiff lawyers around the country. When we bought Advocate, it had one customer. We now have about 448 last count we added to this week. Um, and so I've been reviewing the tax returns, financial statements, business plans, and business results of contingent fee law firms now um, every business day since 1999. So that's the experience. It's not because I read about it in a book somewhere because I've been living it. I mentioned the book already, uh, All Profits Go to uh, the AAJ. If you're attending this webinar and you would like a copy of my book, message me or email me. I'd be happy to send you an autographed copy. Um, we enjoy helping plaintiff lawyers get results. We believe in what you do as a plaintiff lawyer. We know that you help people all day, and that's what really motivates us. Okay, so let's get started with managing your growing law firm for success. Here's the outline. We're going to talk about a few different things today. First, motivation and goals. Next, a little bit about marketing. We'll talk about managing people, which I think is one of the crucial aspects of business success. We'll talk about metrics, what you should be measuring and how. We'll talk about a little bit about capitalization. Not too much, though, because I have a separate uh, webinar called Law Firm Finance 101. Uh, you can ask me for a link to the last one or tune in for the next one if you want to get, get deeper into the financial aspect of contingent fee law practice. We'll talk about long-term planning and lastly we'll talk about rate of growth. So if you're watching this video or attending this webinar rather, um, it may be because you're either growing already or you want to grow your law firm. So the first thing I would ask you is why do you want to grow? There needs to be a solid business reason for wanting to grow. Is it because you want to help more people? Is it because you want to have a higher income or a better net worth for your um, uh, for your family? Um, you should know why you want to grow, not just let's grow. Um, and I think it's important to be able to also communicate that to your team. So at Advocate Capital, we have a mission. We know what to do every day, but we also know why we do it. The reason we do it is that our mission is to help an ever-increasing number of plaintiff lawyers get even better results for their clients. I think it's important to have a mission for your organization that you can communicate. So rather than just grow, wrap it around the, uh, some kind of a mission. Um, this is a great book. It's called Start With Why, and it gets leaders thinking about the motivation that people need to uh, carry on with their daily activities, not just, again, what to do or how to do it, but why are we doing this? Why are we in this boat together, and how can we all row together? So that's my first book recommendation today, Start With Why by Simon Sinek, and thanks to Laszlo Kovac here at Advocate for recommending that book to me. So once you know why you want to grow, it's important to set goals. So a goal is specific, it's measurable, and it's time-bounded. So uh, if your growth has to do with revenues, uh, state your goal is I want to get to $2 million in annual fee revenue by 
uh, December 31st of 2019. So it should be something that's specific and measurable and, measurable and time bound and not just I want to grow. Very important then if you can share that with as many people as possible so they can help you reach that goal. Don't make it a secret. Be public with your goal. I'm going to urge you to think about your law practice as a business. And a business is a system for generating profits. Right? That's what a business is. Now you're in this type of law to help people mainly. I, I know that. However, the way you can help them best is to run your business the best, right? So your business is a system for generating profits. Busy does not necessarily mean successful when it comes to running a business. So we've all known restaurants, maybe even a favorite restaurant that was always busy and one day you go and the doors are padlocked. Well, busy doesn't mean success because a business has to have a profit at least at some point over time. So it's a system for generating profits, uh, not above people. Don't put money above people, but you need to run your law practice as a system for generating profits. If it's not a profit, if there are no profits, it's not a business. All right, so the better your business is, the better results will be for your clients. And so uh, if you've not been thinking about your law practice as a business, you should, and we'll talk more about how you can approach that. All right, we'll talk just a little bit about marketing, but there are plenty webinars out there um, about how to market your, your law practice. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on a lot of specifics. I'll share just a few things we've learned over time. And the first is the axiom that if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And this applies to pretty much everything in business, not just marketing. But if you're just throwing money at pay-per-click or you know, if you're still in the yellow pages or whatever it is you're doing, billboards, TV, whatever it might be, if you're not measuring it, you can't manage it properly. You need to be measuring your marketing expenditures on how well they're doing at bringing cases into you. And we'll talk a little bit more about what to measure in the metric section today. But if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. If someone is managing your marketing for you in your law practice, you need to have them come in each month and say, how are we doing? Tell me what you're measuring. Tell me what kind of return we're getting on that. Um, and make them measure things and not just have a nebulous budget for marketing. So um, another great um, technique for implementing continuous improvement applies to marketing when you're measuring it. So you want to plan your marketing. You want to do your marketing. You want to check on how it's going and then make adjustments. And this cycle of plan, do, check, adjust was first introduced by Dr. Uh, w. Edwards um, uh, Deming as a, um, a tenet of continuous improvement. So this applies to really everything in your business, but it certainly should apply to marketing. Plan it, do it, check in on a regular basis, maybe monthly, maybe quarterly, make adjustments as needed. Also on marketing, just an observation here, the last thing about marketing in particular, I, I can tell you that from the hundreds of law firms that we have as clients and have had over the years as clients, we've noticed that referral-based marketing can be the most cost-effective, most efficient way to market. So that's based upon relationships. And I'm sure uh, we all are very familiar with getting referrals from other lawyers, uh, other maybe plaintiff lawyers even, who just want help with the case financially, what have you. But if you would take the time to build relationships and a tale of relationships behind you in your practice, it can be very, very cost-effective. And there are a couple of things you can do. Um, develop relationships with doctors, um, develop relationships with other types of lawyers uh, and stay in touch with them on a regular basis. Maybe an estate lawyer, um, maybe somebody they know is injured. Hey, I can't take your case, but I know my friend down the street can. Uh, stay in touch with your former clients. That's a fantastic source of referrals. We have a great client in Kentucky. All they do for marketing is basically send out uh, birthday cards to their former clients, maybe a refrigerator magnet to stay top of mind. And as they build this tale of very happy clients behind them over the years, it's just organically growing the practice with very little expenditure. So if you're not doing something to keep in touch with your former clients and to build relationships with other uh, professionals or sources of rev, uh, referrals in your community, you should be doing that. And frankly, it's cost effective because it's not fee sharing. You know, if you're fee sharing with the plaintiff lawyer, um, that there's a certain very substantial cost to that. But if a, a doctor uh, sends a case to you, you know, what's the cost of that? Maybe a lunch uh, every year to take them out? All right, let's talk about the most important thing, uh, aspect of building any business, uh, I think, and that is managing people. And I'm going to distinguish between management and leadership. Those are two different things. Management, though, is pretty basic, okay? 
management is a communications job. So if you're managing people, if you have people reporting to you, or you have managers in your business who have people reporting to them, there are three things they should be communicating on a routine basis, ideally daily if possible. Three things, expectations, how well those expectations are being met, and that the manager is there as a resource for the tools and training and supplies to get the job done. That's the basic management 101. I learned 90% of everything I needed to know to run a business in terms of managing people in this book. Um, the one It used to be called the One Minute Manager, now it's called the New One Minute Manager. Short, easy book, it's told in the form of an allegory. Very easy to read, you can sit down and read it probably in an hour and a half, two hours, can't say enough about it. it it's uh, a must read, uh, part of the curriculum for all the management team here at Advocate Capital. Uh, and we really run our business on those concepts, communicating ex expectations, how well it's being done, and that uh, the manager's there as a resource. I meet with all my managers on a regular basis. I ask them, what have you done to communicate expectations this week, or how well they're being met, or that you're a resource, and they need to have an answer for that, and you should too. Another thing I've learned over time uh, is how important the chain of command is in an organization, especially as you grow. So if you're growing, you're growing your, your law practice, First of all, you need to have an organizational chart, and you need to have a chain of command. So every person in the business wants to have one boss, not three. So if there are three partners at the law firm, um, the you know the legal assistant should not report to all three of them. They should, that legal assistant should have one boss. So chain of command is very important in a couple different directions. First is delegating things down through the chain of command. So uh, each person should only get assignments for one person because they might get three different things from three different lawyers and not know what to do, get frustrated and quit, and not get good results. And all three of the lawyers will think they're not doing what they should because they're not getting what they asked them to do. So one boss uh, for each person. Um, and the other thing is, going back up through the chain of command, if someone has a question, um, they need to know they can count on a supervisor to ask them that question, get that information, get the resources from them, rather than I'm just gonna try everybody and see what happens. So chain of command, um, lend, lends itself to much more efficient organization and it, it's more important the larger that you grow. So spend some time thinking about that. Do any, does anybody in your business, in your law firm, have multiple bosses? Um, take steps to fix that. Another thing you'll need to do, if you haven't already, if you're growing your practice or any business, is you need to have written procedures. So about six years ago, uh, we sat down and I said to the management team, we need a written procedure for everything everybody does at Advocate and they groaned, didn't want to do it, maybe eight years ago, but we just got started with the basics. We just started writing them out, typing them up, saving the PDFs on the server, and now we have literally hundreds of written procedures uh, for every single action that someone takes inside of our business. And uh, it's important for a few different reasons. One is quality control, so that you know that tasks and jobs are being done on a consistent basis without missing steps, and then it's complete. Uh, secondly, it gives you control over the ship. You can turn the ship um, by changing a procedure. So if there are seven people who follow this procedure, simply by editing the procedure and communicating to that, that to them, hey, look, step number seven is new, you can efficiently steer the ship in the direction you need to go, and it lends itself very well to continuous improvement. That's one of our core values here at Advocate is continuous improvement. So we are continuously redlining and adopting changes in our procedures, maybe um, technology changes, or maybe we recognize a missed step or an obsolete step. So we're continuously updating those at least quarterly, um, and uh, having written procedures also helps you when you're growing because as you bring new people into your business, you're able to train them quickly. So we can literally have someone producing useful work on the first day they're in our business because we can sit down, here are the, the 14 procedures you'll eventually learn, let's learn this one first today, watch me do it, I'll watch you do it, now you go do it five times and I'll come back and see how you did. So people can be productive very, very quickly. Uh, it also enables uh, you to be cross-trained. So if uh, you should not have anything in the business that only one person knows how to do. And having procedures allows you to make a matrix of procedures and then who knows how to do them, fill in any gaps, do cross-training so that if someone calls in sick today, their backups can step right in, they know what procedures to follow and continue to move the business forward. Okay, so written procedures. A fantastic resource when it comes to written procedures is this book. This book's called The Power of a System and it's by a friend and uh, also a client of ours called uh, named John Fisher. And John is a personal injury lawyer in up upper New York, uh, in upstate New York, 
brilliant guy, great marketer, but also a great business person. And he wrote this book, and I think I have a copy. Yeah. Oh, I have this too, right by my side, of course, at all times. Here's the power of a system. This is like a textbook. I mean, this is an incredible book. Um, John, um, I know if you're a friend of mine or a client and you ask me, I can get you a copy of this book. It sells for about $300, I think, on Amazon. And this is like a textbook on everything about how to run a personal injury law firm except being a lawyer. So it's basically an operations manual. It has um, standardized forms, procedures in there. Uh, boy, if you're looking to grow, this Power of a System book uh, can make a huge, huge difference in your practice. Plus, it will shorten the time it will take you to get from where you are now to where you want to be in terms of growing your practice. Great book by John Fisher. All right, as you grow, uh, as you get more and more employees, you need to plan for the human resource functions, things like um, giving reviews, um, administering pay raises, uh, recruiting interviewing, hiring, these kinds of things. Uh, when you're small, it's probably done all by you, but as you get bigger, you're going to need to delegate that to somebody. So you need to either have an outsourced resource for some of these human resource issues, uh, or you're going to need to hire somebody and train them internally. Uh, don't think it'll take care of itself. People don't manage themselves. People deserve an annual review. They deserve at least a consideration of an annual um, uh, salary increase. Um, and you need to be hiring the right people in your business. And if you're just hiring anybody who walks in the door because no one here really knows how to interview, uh, you're going to pay for it, especially if you're trying to grow the business. So plan ahead who's going to fulfill the human resource functions in your business. Um, I already touched on this. You should create a performance and compensation program in your business as you grow. Uh, at Advocate, we have 39 employees right now. And just last year, uh, we did a complete revamp using uh, a great company called Arthur J. Gallagher that came in and helped us design a customized performance and review system starting with job descriptions uh, all the way through the review form itself, uh, career path matrices, job grades, pay grades, uh, wonderful structure, not cheap, absolutely worth it. So it doesn't have, you don't have to go that big at first, but you're going to get there if you're growing and that's a very important aspect of your business. So do create a performance and compensation program. If you're too small, um, a lot of forms are available, frankly, for free online. You can put something together yourself, maybe hire a consultant to come in, pay him for a few hours of work to put it together. Uh, people deserve and want regular feedback about their jobs. Uh, another really important aspect of growing any business is to make training, quality training available to all of your employees so that they can come up to speed yes, on what to do, but also kind of how to do it and some of the, the soft skills needed in business today. Uh, I find that uh, people with college degrees, many of them really can't write very well. Uh, they may not have some of the basic business skills that they need. Uh, so we have found a terrific resource for that. It's called lynda.com. They're owned by LinkedIn now. lynda.com is a cloud-based subscription service. So we have a, um, purchased a subscription to Lynda for every employee in our business. We developed seven core courses that we call Advocate Capital University, and every employee um, has to con complete all seven of those courses, things like basic customer service, business communication, time management, uh, how to work on a team. Some fantastic content. You don't have to do a lot of research. It's not that expensive. It's about the cost of sending someone to class once outside the building a year, and you get an entire library of very, very high quality content. So I highly recommend lynda.com. Another aspect of building the right team, as I mentioned before, is how to hire the right employees. Hiring is an art. Um, there's some science to it. Um, and if you want to lend some science to it, I recommend uh, a group called PI Midlantic. We use them for all of our hiring and some of our management um, consulting work. Um, PI Midlantic, um, our contact is a guy named Bill Barker. His phone number is on the screen, 410-295-0771. Bill has been an, an integral part of our success over the past, I think, gosh, seven, eight years. Bill uses uh, a tool called a predictive index. That's why it's PI, Mid-Atlantic Predictive Index. This is a test unlike ones you've taken before. Um, and this test is fantastic at letting you see inside what a person uh, likes, what they're good at, what their, their weaknesses might be, what's going to be a good role for them. So he starts with you by uh, creating a, a survey of the position that you're hiring for. Then when you get your final candidates, they take this test and it'll give you an incredible narrative of what this person likes to do at work all day and doesn't like to do. Uh, and then Bill will sit with you on the phone for an hour if you want to and compare this person's resume, 
to their um, their PI test to the the survey for the position and help you match the right people. You know, hiring is about putting square pegs in square holes, not round pegs in square holes. They don't fit. Uh, and he will help you avoid mistakes. A lot cheaper to catch it up front than hire the wrong person. He's also very good at helping you understand, well, if you hire this person, they're going to get bored easily. So recognize that up front, tell them that, and think of a strategy to help them not get bored quickly or what have you. It also gives you strategies on the best way to manage the person, what kind of feedback they like, what kind of approach they'd like to hear from their manager. And if you're hiring them for a sales type position, it'll talk about you know what type of a sales approach they would take. So PI Mid Landing, Bill Barker. Collaboration. Um, I've learned over the years the best way to um, uh, run a business is through collaboration. Uh, try not to make too many mis uh, decisions uh, from the top down if you can. Um, as you develop uh, a management team beneath you, um, train them that they're not there to identify problems for you to solve. They're there to identify problems, get together, discuss solutions, and recommend a solution. So if someone says, Mike, we have a problem over here, I'll say, let me know when you've come up with a, a suggestion for a solution because you're not a problem identifier, right? And you, sh you should be telling them the same thing. No one's paying you to identify problems. They're identifying, you're there to identify problems, collaborate with your coworkers, discuss it, don't make it just in a silo. Take into consideration the affected departments, come up with a solution. Now it takes longer uh, to run the business that way. And you can't run the business that way if, if, you're, if you're on the battlefield and your shells are flying and you need a quick decision on something. But most of the time in business, you have the time to do it right, which means collaborate, get input from the people affected, let them have a voice. You'll get much better results, you'll have better solutions, and you'll have much better buy-in from everybody involved because they had a chance to contribute to the solution and have a dialogue about that. Okay, that's my managing people part. Excuse me for a coffee break. Let's talk a little bit about metrics, and I'm going to mention some of the metrics here that we see successful uh, personal injury and, and contingent fee law, law firms applying in their practices to see if maybe it might apply for you. So we mentioned before, if you, uh, if you don't measure it, you can't possibly manage it. Doesn't mean you won't be successful, but you're there as a CEO to run and manage the business, and if you're not measuring aspects of your business, you're not managing them. They're just running on their own. Uh, so it's important to measure that, especially as you're growing because things change rapidly. Okay, a couple of the key metrics you need to be uh, paying attention to as the key business owner um, are your financial statements. And I know that if you're a plaintiff lawyer listening to this or watching this today, you most likely have an undergrad degree in political science, history, English, psychology, sociology. I probably hit you. Economics. Um, and so you really probably don't have an inherent interest in business, uh, or, or you may not, and reading numbers uh, makes your eyes roll back in your head. <laughs> uh, I understand that, but if you're going to grow a law firm to a significant size business, uh, you as the CEO or as the leader of that business needs to take the time and the discipline to understand what is a balance sheet, what's an income statement, what's a cash flow statement, and then you need to be reviewing them monthly. I spend about four hours a month reviewing our financial statements. I ask pointed questions to the team that prepares them. Those are then reviewed by our outside um, uh, uh, CPA and very carefully studied because you need to be paying attention, especially if you're growing, so things don't get out of hand. All right. Um, you also should develop a growth and cash flow forecast. You're probably not uh, skilled enough to do that. You may not have someone in-house who can do that. There are professionals that you can hire talk to your CPA and, and get a bookkeeper or someone to start mapping out a basic growth and cash flow forecast to help you see what's coming. Don't just rush through every month and hope for the best. If you're going to grow, you need uh, some forecasts and then you need to compare how are we doing compared to the forecast every month. That's what we do. Here's the forecast. Where are we relative to the forecast? Where are we falling short? What needs to happen to make it, make it work? Another important uh, metrics are your own metrics. So. There are, as the owner of a service business, which is what a plaintiff law firm is, um, your personal credit and net worth will affect your ability to access capital in the marketplace because uh, most likely you don't have sufficient assets at the law firm level to secure funding from a bank, et cetera. So they're going to be looking at you personally. So there are a couple things you need to be doing. One is completing a personal financial statement at least annually. Very simple piece of paper. Here's everything I own. Here's everything I owe. Here's the difference. 
And don't think that your law firm's worth $20 million, because it's not. I'm talking about things a bank can look at and actually attach a value to. Real estate, bank accounts, investments, um, and not like your collection of Rolex watches or whatever it be. So uh, build up some assets, build some net worth, and you need to know that. And it might not be a big number. That's okay. You need to know what the number is, and you need to look at it every year. Um, you also want to me make sure you're looking at it every year, because it should be growing. So if you're growing this law firm and you're hiring more and more people and you're taking more and more cases and helping more and more people, but you're static, I question that. Um, I, I think you should be building net worth outside your law firm. I think that's the best benefit financially of owning a contingent fee law firm is to pay yourself and build net worth over time outside the law firm. The number two thing, a ma metrics you need to know personally is your credit score. Uh, there's no reason not to know that. You can get a free credit report every year from the, all three agencies. I use myfico.com. Cost me a few bucks. They email and text me quarterly so I know what's going on with my credit score. Banks make mistakes. Someone can report something past due that's not. You need to maintain a high credit score to get access to capital in an efficient way. Um, some other marketing um, type statistics we see um, being uh, tracked by the more su successful and sophisticated law firms. Uh, marketing costs per case by type of marketing. So breaking it out on a very granular way to know what are we spending per case uh, and by, by case type. What are we spending to get each uh, mass tort referral uh, or signed up? What are we spending to get each, each um, soft tissue case, etc.? cetera? Uh, you also want to uh, look at marketing costs by, per case by channel. What are we spending per channel? So a channel would be TV, um, bus bench ads, billboards, each channel. You should be analyzing those, your marketing costs per case per channel. And think marginal. So when you're analyzing uh, and making decisions on marketing expenses, what really matters is the marginal uh, expense. And what that is is the next dollar you're about to spend on that channel. So right now, hey, we're spending um, you know, 100000 a year on billboards. We're tracking that. Uh, after all expenses, we're making 150000 a year on those cases. So you know, we're making a $50,000 return on that channel. Uh, so let's double it. Well, maybe, maybe not. Um, you may, may not want to do that. You need to know what is the, the value of the next dollar we spend on billboards. And the way you do that is by incrementally making changes plan, check, do, adjust, and see what additional return are we getting. So let's increase uh, that budget by 10% and come back around in six or nine months and see have we increased the actual profits from that channel by 10%. You, maybe you did, maybe you didn't. There is a law of diminishing returns for each channel and you want to try to find the sweet spot so that you know that the next dollar I spend will not be worth it. I'm going to back off that by one dollar. You can't get that exact, but think marginal expense, not just average expense. Uh, intake conversion rate by employees is an interesting uh, thing to, to measure, and I know a friend of mine, Stephen Fairley, talks a lot about this. Um, you know, who should be doing the intake at your law firm? Should it be a lawyer? Probably not. They're not trained to do that. Uh, should it be a paralegal? They're probably overworked and don't want more cases anyway. Um, if you get large enough, you should, should consider having specific people who are trained to do intake. And if you have multiple people doing intake, you want to measure how they're doing. And what you'll find is some people are better at others at signing up cases. So, okay, you have three employees, they all take calls, they all do intake, they all have the same procedures, but if you measure it, I think what you'll find is some people are going to be much better at the intake conversion rate. And so you can learn from that, right? So you can find you're the best at that, let's have the other two study what you're doing and imitate you. Or maybe you say, you know what, we're going to have you do nothing but intakes because you're so good and we'll retrain these people over here to do something different. Um, so think about intake conversion rate by employee. Um, and also, uh, uh, I think an excellent thing to do as your law firm grows, uh, we see the more sophisticated firms doing is looking at practice areas as cost centers, almost as if they're individual law firms. So if you have a division doing SSDI, personal injury, mass tort, see if you can configure your financial statements to start tracking both your revenues and your associated costs on a practice area basis to see which practice areas are actually profitable and not profitable. Um, some are very difficult to be profitable and SSDI is hard to do in a profitable way. Um, so it's important to associate um, both the marketing costs and then your overhead costs, the, um, the 
cost of the um, the legal team and the support team and a, a fraction of their your, your overhead uh, and then you can make decisions well look our most profitable area is let's say it is SSDI well why don't we convert some more of the staff and the marketing dollar, dollars in this less less profitable area over here and devote it to the profitable part of the business so practice area by cost center uh, revenues by lawyer. You should make your, uh, especially your non-partner uh, lawyers, but uh, really all the lawyers should be measured what kind of revenues are they bringing in what, um, in terms of their ability to get results for clients because what you're also measuring is not just revenues for the law firm, you're measuring re uh, revenues they're bringing in for your clients. Which ones are the most effective and do you need to make changes? Do you need to trim a couple of lawyers because they're not getting good results? Um, and you should make them accountable to the actual revenue that they're bringing in and account for the cost of their salary as well. Okay, a couple case metrics. We'll uh, move through these quickly. Um, something to think about: average and median fees by case type, right? Whether it's certain types of cases, what are the average and median fees? Allows you to start dialing into that profitability. The amount of time on desk: how long it takes you from sign up to conclusion of a case by case type. Again, it helps you analyze the real profitability um, of cases by type of case. Um, Average and median case expenses required for certain you know, for my case type, so you can factor that into your analysis as well. Uh, and then also employee costs required by case type. Uh, every case is type is a little bit different. It requires different amounts of investment and expenses uh, in, in employees. And then marginal overall cost per case by type. So that, again, that's similar concept to the marketing marginal dollar. What's it going to take you? To, what's it going to cost you on a marginal basis to take in one more SSDA, SSDI case, and how much will that case uh, net you in the end to help you make those decisions? Should we be taking uh, more dollars, uh, more cases in there? Okay, that's the metrics part. Hope you, hopefully, you got a couple of ideas of things you could measure that you haven't been. Let's talk about capitalization, and by that I mean how do you get the money to run your law practice? Um, again, I have a whole, I have a book on that. Um, I'll send you a copy if you want. We won't spend a lot of time on this this part today. Um, and I also have a separate webinar, Law Firm Finance 101, where we dive deep into uh, some of these topics. I'll just touch on the highlights today. So because we're talking about growing a law firm, I urge you to put cash flow before growth. The law firms we've seen get in trouble could be good lawyers, great people, great marketers, great at practicing law, do everything perfectly, but they put growth before cash flow. And you can do that for a short period of time, but you need to have a very tight control on that and measurement of that and the ability to quickly turn to cash flow positive if, if you want to and when you need to um, so that you can change that. So if you're going to go cash flow negative for a while just to grow your, your business, you need to have a very tight grip on your cash flow statement, your income statement, and your ability to quickly flip a switch and make changes to become cash flow positive. Uh, many law firms get into big trouble because they go cash flow negative, say growth, 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 they run through their bank line, and then they have to start turning to more expensive forms of capital like some of the non-bank lenders or um, you know, some of the non-recourse lenders that are charging 100% per year. Um, so cash flow before growth. You'll never say, oh, I wish I would have put growth before cash flow. No one ever says that. Pay yourself first. So important. So. The, val the, the societal value of your law firm is tremendous in that you are the keys to the courtroom, right? Your clients would never get their day in court uh, except for the work that you do, your willingness to um, make the Seventh Amendment real to them, to be the keys to the courtroom, huge societal benefit. On the ownership side though, I think economically the number one benefit of owning a contingent fee law firm is the ability to pay yourself and build net worth outside your law firm. I touched on it earlier. The best advice I can give you, pay yourself and build net worth outside your law firm. Look at your personal financial statement every year. Put it in Excel, graph it. If it's not going up, I would contend you're doing something wrong because you need to be preparing for the future. We know that bad things happen to good people. You could get disabled. Um, your law partner could get disabled. There could be a fire at your office. There could be a flood. These are all things that, that um, we've known to happen to people. An employee could embezzle from your law firm uh, and cause huge problems there. So the way to protect yourself against those things is maybe some insurance products, but the best way is to build net worth outside of your law firm so it's not in harm's way. Too many law firm, uh, lawyers that are hardworking, great lawyers, passionate people, skilled people, um, just fantastic lawyers, 
have not done that, and they they have to work until they die. So, you might want to work till you die. Not wrong with that. Um, I'm not sure if I'm ever going to retire, but I at least want the option to do that. Um, no one's going to walk down the street and write you a big check for $10 million to buy your law firm from you. It doesn't work that way. You probably know that. They're going to say, well, we'll give you 20% into the remaining cases. You know, um, it's hard to retire on that. So, sorry to repeat it, but build net worth outside your law firm. It's the best thing you can do for you, for your family, and ultimately for your business. Because if your business is backed by a broke lawyer, no one should want to hire you. You know, if you're going to hire a contingent fee lawyer, you want to know do they have the capital to withstand uh, a storm. Otherwise, you don't want them on your case. All right, we'll talk a little bit about long-term planning. So failing to plan is the same as planning to fail. If you're not doing long-term planning, if you're not planning ahead for your business and all aspects of the business, if you're not taking time daily, weekly, monthly to think, to just sit and think about what happens next in each area of my business, where am I going here, do I need more office space? Do I need to update my computer system? Do I need to hire somebody? Um, you're planning to fail. Uh, love this quote from Zig Ziglar. If you discipline yourself to do the things you need to do when you need to do them, the day will come when you will be able to do things you want to do when you want to do them. So great folks, you guys, Zig Ziglar, really like that one. And that's what it comes down to is disciplining yourself. Um, too many of us only want to do the things we like in our business. And uh, one of the keys to success in every business, including a law practice, is forcing yourself to do the things you may not want to do, like look at an organizational chart. <laughs> I talked about that before. If you don't have one, just get a piece of paper, write it out. Who reports to who? Have your assistant put it in Excel or whatever it might be, uh, and then think ahead. What is that chart going to look like in a year and in five years? At one point, will I need a manager to oversee this department, and how, where am I going to find that person? Can I, re, can I develop someone on my team to be ready for that, right? So you need to be thinking about your organization just visually on the organizational chart, not just for chain of command reasons, but for planning purposes to think ahead, help yourself think ahead. As I said before, part of long-term planning is to develop a forecast. It's going to help you forecast financially, but also headcount, office space. We have a um, headcount spreadsheet. We, we've been growing uh, Advocate Capital 15% per year on a compound annual growth rate every year since 1999. So you, you best believe we have a nice big old spreadsheet. Every department has their projected headcounts and the hiring dates in the future and our operations team is mapping out our office. Who's going to sit where? What's it look like next year and the year after? And you should be doing the same, especially if you're growing significantly. Think also about the expertise you're going to need in your business. Just because you're a contingent fee lawyer doesn't necessarily mean you're qualified or even want to do certain roles in the business when it gets larger that you're going to need to have. You know, you're going to need to have an accountant or a bookkeeper or even a CFO um, either inside the business or outsourced. That's not that shouldn't be you. It shouldn't be um, the receptionist who, oh, well, we're we're bigger now, so you're now the CFO. Hey, figure QuickBooks out. Okay, that, that's a recipe for disaster. Um, you need human resource management at some point. Plan ahead for that. When are you going to need that? What's it going to look like? You need to ha eventually build a management team. Um, we're a fairly flat organization here. My experience is that a manager can efficiently supervise up to maybe eight to ten people if they're all in the exact same job role. If it's a variety of job uh, descriptions they're managing, more like five or six people. So when you start drawing that organizational chart, you need to think about building a management team and training them how to manage people because you can't do it yourself anymore. You need to have the right lawyers in the business. Um, too many PI lawyers think they can read contracts and know what the market is. They don't. So be prepared uh, for the right types of lawyers, for the right roles, not just the lawyers who do the casework for you, but advise you as a business owner. Uh, and then CEO. Who's going to be the CEO of your business? Is it going to be you? Um, are you going to work in the business as a lawyer mainly, or do you want to work on the business as a business manager? Um, you need to make a decision about that. It's hard to do both. I'm not sure you can. You can't take much of a caseload and be the CEO of a large business. Eventually, you should be doing only the things that you can do if you want to be efficient at running the business. And uh, I think that means being the CEO. But maybe you're not cut out for that. That's okay. You can hire a professional manager to come in and manage the business for you. And uh, you can work alongside them, and they can do the things maybe you don't like to do, or maybe the things you're not really qualified to do. Are you qualified to be a CEO? Um, you can use Bill Barker in the PI test. Take the test yourself. Uh, discuss with Bill where you are in your law practice, where you want to go. 
what does Bill see that where you might need some additional training or support or areas that you would be strong at? Um, so self-assessment, I think, is important for long-term planning as well. Um, is the business eventually going to outgrow you as a CEO? What are you going to do about that rather than just let it outgrow you and get poor results? So um, seek out training for yourself if you're going to try to be the CEO. Uh, you can learn from CEOs in other industries like you're doing today. Uh, and then um, there's a different, differentiation between being a CEO and just a manager in the business. The CEO gets above the business, looks out long term, um, assesses needs of the business, assesses um, or, or assigns resources where needed and provides that vision for the organization. Hey, here's where we're going and why. So your business needs that function. Um, doesn't have to be called the CEO, but it, it needs that function. And lastly, we'll talk about rate of growth. Uh, I talked before about cash flow um, versus growth. You can grow too fast. Uh, I've had lawyers tell me, oh, Mike, we want to be a customer and we're, we're doubling the size of our business every year. We're going to keep doing that for 10 years. And I'm, I, I'm very suspicious of that. Um, we've been growing 15% a year every year for, I don't know, 18 years. And that's dang hard to do. Uh, not just to get the business in, but also to manage it effectively. So uh, you can grow too fast. Uh, you can absolutely grow too fast. So um, the markets will, will penalize you when it comes to capitalization if you grow too fast. Uh, so the faster you grow, the fewer options you will have for obtaining outside funding if that's what part of your plan is. So if you tell your bank, we're going to double our business every year for five years and we want to borrow a bunch of money, the bank's going to be very suspicious of that. Uh, a bank, um, is, we like to joke, is a building full of people who've never done anything for the first time. Excuse me to my banker friends who might be watching. Uh, but the higher the growth rate, the higher the risk, uh, generally speaking, for the financial markets, which translates into fewer options and higher costs. So the market will limit you uh, to how fast you can grow unless you just have such a war chest you can do it yourself. And then ask yourself, where do you want to stop? You, you want to grow? How big do you want to be and then what? You know, one of my favorite sayings in business is then what? Okay, you grow to two million in revenues, then what? Are you going to pull back and become profitable? Do you have plans for retirement? What kind of lifestyle do you want to have uh, rather than just grow forever um, with no end in sight? And it, it really does come down to lifestyle decisions that you need to make. Um, how many hours a week do you want to work? Do you want to be home for your kids school play? Do you want to be able to take a vacation and not work? Um, these are good things to work toward to spend more time with your family. Okay, that is our presentation for today. Um, sorry it's not been very interactive. I didn't have any polls today. We just, um, uh, you had to listen to me talk. I'm glad you, you hung in there. I noticed that we have um, uh, a few uh, uh, customers uh, watching today. Thank you for being a customer. We appreciate you. We hope that this is helpful to you. Give me a call if you want to talk some more about anything you heard. If any of you have questions, um, we can take them now. I don't know if we have any. Let's see. Um, okay. Um, ah, here's a oh, oh here's a here's a great idea um, from one of the viewers as far as keeping in touch with clients. Uh, he shares that you should call your cust your former clients or your existing clients on their birthdays and wish them a happy birthday as a, as a great way of upping the customer service. Great idea. Might add that to my next one. Give them a call. Um, unless you have 10,000 customers, it should be a doable deal. Okay. Great. Well, I don't see any other questions. If you do have some, um, I'll put my contact information on the screen. You can email me. Uh, give us a call here at the office. Uh, if you want to know more about Advocate Capital, you can do that, of course, at advocatecapital.com. Um, if you want a copy of my book, you don't have to buy it. I'll send you one. Um, and then this recording will go out to you via email if you want to share it with friends or view it again later for some of those contact names and re um, references. Uh, and then below this video on uh, either, either uh, YouTube and or Vimeo will have my contact information or a way to get a hold of me. So thanks for all you do as a contingent fee lawyer. We know you help people all day, uh, and we get a lot of fun helping you do what you do. Thanks.